So, I'm Suzanne Williams, and my husband Sandy, who's wandering around in the back there, uh, we've been gardening in, mainly in uh, Shady Hole and Douglas uh, since, um, probably since 1972. And later on, as we struggled, we started out that I got tired of looking at iceberg lettuce and remain in the grocery store and decided we needed something else then. And I started growing lettuce and peas, just trying to get my boys to eat a little bit better. And then we went in to, uh, we decided we wanted to do more. Uh, one summer, uh, Sandy did plant potatoes and uh, the slugs came and ate all the leaves and we didn't understand what was going on about slugs then. But since then we've taken the Master Gardener course. Um, we've learned more from fellow Master Gardeners, the Extension Agent, and a lot of these people here in the audience are fellow Master Gardeners, so I'm not the only one you can ask questions of today. But anyhow, uh, both Sandy and I are retired. We're in our 70s. We've got arthritis, aches and pains, and we're still gardening. We're mainly vegetable gardeners, so if you ask me about flowers, I'll probably kind of stare at you kind of blankly because I'm not a flower expert, neither is Sandy. We grow uh, a lot of berries and vegetables, and we do have uh, several trees, crab apples, around our property. So, let's begin. Um, raised beds and soil covers uh, in Douglas, Alaska. And if you could try to bring up the next slide. We're dealing with an older computer and we're struggling through. Okay, this is our garden in Douglas. And you will notice, uh, maybe I should have Sandy come up here. Sandy, you get the magic stick. Um, Sandy can point out to you that it is spring, it's April. We are warming our soil. And what you do, we've taken off our black plastic. That's just cheap black plastic that you can get at all our hardware stores. We lay down to cover the soil during the winter time. And that's so because we live in southeast Alaska where it rains and it's cold and we don't want the fertilizer that we've already established in our raised beds to leach out of the soil. So that's why we put the black plastic down. It's not to keep the weeds out, it's to keep the beds dry as possible. Sandy and I put down clear plastic and you see these are our raised beds here. And that's because we're right down on the soil because we want to get the sun to come in, what little there is here, let's face it. But today is great. And to warm up that soil and so we can start heating up the beds. Uh, our greenhouse, Sandy's greenhouse, is over there on the left. Uh, our tool sheds in the center. And then the strange white pipes you see sticking up there in an odd angle are our compost beds. That's four inch perforated PVC pipe. And we start out with a couple of rocks trying to hold it in the center, but as we dump stuff out on it, it leans over. Uh, but uh, just as a sideline, the reason for the PVC pipe is to get oxygen down into the compost bed. And we use the cold method. Um, I would say the center one and the lowest one, Sandy, can you point to that? That is going to be sieved this spring and put on the beds. That's our third year bin. The next one is the second year bin. That was from two years before. And the one that's high, that's the one we put the compost on last year. And it's going to work. I don't turn it. We don't flip it. We just pile it up and we let it rot. That's the basic of composting. But that's another subject. Okay, can you find the next one? Okay, there are many different types of raised beds, as you can see in this picture. These are three slides on top of each other. The bottom one, honey, go to the bottom one, and you see there's one. They've mound up the dirt. They've got clear plastic over it with holes. The one right next to it is just mounds of uh, black soil. And that's out at the Juneau Community Garden. And then the one down at the bottom here, they put rocks around it. And that is to keep the soil from falling off the mound down into the ground and having to pile it up again. You can use logs. Logs are good. But that's the goal, is to raise those mounds up. Up in the next one is what we do mainly at the community garden. And you'll see a lot of samples out there if you go out there at Montana Creek. 
are uh, usually it's what two foot four feet four feet boards with that are two feet two inches wide and it's untreated raw lumber it will last almost 20 years 15 to 20 years because it's thick and uh, the reason for that is when you sit on it it doesn't hurt your butt so bad when you're reading and that's one inch really really is miserable to sit on, but two inches wide, as any gardener here will verify, it's much more comfortable to crouch on while you're reaching in the beds. And you'll notice that the one in back of it has got the clear plastic weighted down with rocks. The one up above, somebody's just got clear plastic down on their mounds weighted with rocks. And in the background, you can see someone has had seaweed they put down and let it sit over the winter. And different methods, so all of it work, helps. Okay, next slide, please. This is in Wrangell. This woman has a wonderful, wonderful garden, and she grows flowers. They have a lot of land. They're right down on the shore, but she's used beams, railroad ties, around the edge, and she's done big beds. She raises the mounds in the center, and then she puts uh, sawdust for her paths. So that's another method that you can use. Okay, next one. Now, this is an, a retired fisherman in Wrangell. He experimented with uh, concrete raised beds. And he said it ended up, the concrete held the cold in, and his beds didn't thaw out as fa fast, and uh, the, uh, he didn't get as good production, because we wanted to raise the soil, drains better, it's warmed up because the surface is exposed to sunlight better, and you get better production. However, it didn't bother the rhubarb, you'll notice. He didn't take them out, he's still keeping them. And you see he's got clear plastic down over here and he's punched holes in it. And he's got plastic hoops in the back. So, so he's trying different methods. Next one. Now this is Sandy and he's uh, building raised beds out at the community garden and he did it for the master gardener test plot several, several years ago. How long ago was it on? About three, three to four years ago. So he starts by mounting the soil along the edge into the center, and there again you see the untreated lumber in the back. And let's see, it's icy straights is where you can get re uh, untreated lumber now. Logging. You can get it icy. You can get it at icy straights. People can't hear. Uh, there is a lumber. There is a lumber mill uh, on the Montana Creek Road. He uh, does a limited amount of work. If you get to him early in the spring, he can get you some uh, material probably. Uh, but you need to get to him early because he's limited in the logs that he has. So there are two sources, but you know it's cheaper if you can get it done locally. Again, you can use your own lumber. Unt member untreated. Next one. Okay, uh, just for the information, those who are not really into gardening, this is the startup soil that we use for vegetables. We sift the dirt through a screen, we put the rocks in the paths, and our measurements are in five gallon pails in 25 pound bags. Per 100 square feet, mix in the dirt and stir together three pails of peat moss, one pail of perlite, three bags of composted steer manure. This is if you're starting to garden for the first time. And then also add three pounds of Alaska fertilizer, which is eight, 32, six, and two pounds of lime. But if you're growing potatoes, no lime on the potatoes, because it kind of creates, uh, encourages scab. And we side dress the plants again in, Ju in June with more fertilizer, compost if you've got it, but usually Alaska fertilizer. Next screen. They're writing? Okay, you can write. <laughs> oh, the, uh, the pre presentation of this video will be on the Master Gardener site if you want to go back and look at it again. I also got a handout which kind of gives that information. So if you don't get it all written down, we'd have a white sheet to hand out to you. Okay, can we go to the next one? Okay, the frames are placed, and Sandy has reinforced the corners. See the corners, how he does it? There's more than one method. Sometimes he uses uh, those uh, metal brackets, or, and it's so, over the years, the soil, as you work it once, the boards want to spread apart, we've found. So that's why we reinforce the corners. 
Okay, next one. As the seasons go on, if you have compost, if compost bins are going and ready to use, each year I add four pails of comp sifted compost to each 100 squ square feet of soil with the composted steer manure and the fertilizers because I now have compost bins. When I started, I didn't. So that's what the first screen was showing, what my vegetable gardens were before I had compost bins. And if the soil becomes compacted over the years, mix in another batch of peat moss and perlite. That can go as long as five years, maybe even longer than that, or six or seven, depending on how much rain and how much it is composted down. I usually look it over and say, oh, time to add some more peat moss and some more perlite. For those of you who don't know what perlite is, it's exploded lava rock. And it's white and it's very light. Okay, uh, next one. PV site, PVC pipe is what we put over on our beds. And you see it's bent over, and you can put it right into the ground, like those are, or you can put big nails up and put them over the nails. Some people even use brackets and leave them up year round, they screw them into the side. And let's see, let's stop a second. Right, the, oh, okay, we'll stop right here uh, on the PVC pipe. Hang up, we've got some. Okay. Maybe, Sandy, you can talk about the PVC pipe and on the other bracket. And I got the perlite uh, to pass around and the peat moss. And let's go. Do you, do you want to hand those around? And you can hold that up. Okay, you see this? Sandy, okay, sorry. I'm sorry here. Sandy's going to pass around the perlite, the lime, and all our soil samples. They're kind of dried out from years and years. This is PVC pipe, and these are the clips I use to hold on either the plastic or the poly spun fiber, and we can pass that around. Here you go, honey. The clips, PVC pipe is, chip, is cheap, but the clips are expensive. They run about $1.50 or so, depending on, and get the, there's two sizes. There's small, and there's one that has a larger diameter. Get the largest possible. And they keep forever. I take them off, put them back on, and, and uh, store them in a flower, big flower pot in my uh, tool shed. Yes. You use hose? Just hose. Rubber hose? Yeah, just cut a section, slice it this way, and clip it on. And clip it on. So there's more than one way of doing it. As I say, this is what Sandy and I are using, but there's more than one way. Okay, next slide. Okay, to start off the year, um, if we're planting beans and squash, they need warmer soil. And so to warm up the soil, we laid the plastic, hold up the plastic, uh, down on the soil, and these are just cheap, plain sheets of plastic. We cut it to fit. And then we cut a hole, you can use a round hole, a square hole, and I uh, plant the beans right in there. Sandy will start uh, beans and squash, uh, not the beans, but the squash, and we try and transplant them. But because they are tri-leaf plants, as you call, they have a leaf that's sort of like three, they tend not to transplant well. The same is also true for cucumbers when you put them in the greenhouse, cucumbers, squash, and beans seem to go through transplant shock quite easily. So to compensate for that, we'll put the plants in, but we know we're going to have die off here. It's just how it is here. I will also put three seeds of the squash or the beans in each hole. And if the plant lives, I snap off the bean sprouts. But if the plant doesn't live and the beans, uh, and the beans or the squash seeds come up, I will cut two of them and leave only one plant to grow. Okay, next slide. And so then we get into two types of covers. Uh, stick. It's on the table. Yeah, you'll need both. <laughs> no, the stick, honey. I need to point. The stick. <laughs> okay. The first one here is how we treat the squash and the beans. We put plastic covers, and you see the, uh, my clips are on there or, you know, use wire on the hoops. 
on the sides, and we even weight them down with the rock so they don't blow over, but we leave the ends open for air circulation, and also we want the little bees and so forth, critters to fly in and help with the pollinate. And we don't want the, the it gets damp and drank, and they're apt to do it. If you keep both ends closed, it creates moisture, and you don't want the moisture in there. You want them to be dry as possible. With the clips, if we do have a sunny period, we just slide the clips up on one side and water the plants and then put them, put, the, put them back over. Now the one in back, and Sandy's got a sample, is Rime or polyspun fiber. All our plants, uh, except for the squash and the beans, we cover with the polyspun fiber. Rime is one brand, is the one that came out first. You can get it at any of the hardware stores that carry plants. And we put it over the beds, and the ends are tightly closed. And the reason for that is because we have that charming little white butterfly that's so pretty that flies around, lays eggs, and the maggots go in, and they do damage on our turnips and everything in the cabbage family. And that includes the broccoli, the cabbage, and so that's why we keep the ends closed. And Sandy will pass the polyfun fiber around. The rain goes right through it. You can put it through the other side if you, well, hold it up. The advantage of this, if Sandy would hold it up, would you? It comes in uh, many lengths. You can cut it to fit, but it's always six feet wide. So you've got to make sure your hoops are, no, are not too high. And the nice thing about it, at the end of the year, you can wash it in cold water, roll it up, and stuff it. You notice I still got some dirt on it from the year before. And then I can use it. It can be patched with duct tape. And, but after three years or so, the ultraviolet rays do start to destroy it, and it tries to shred up, and then you've got to start over again. But it can be used. Also, uh, in Douglas, when I start the plants, I keep them all covered up because the stellar jays are, at my place, are very curious, and they like to pull up the peas, look them over, and throw them down again. So I tend to keep the reme on as long as possible, if I could have the next screen. This shows the beans are going to be watered, but you just, and this uh, person just took the reme completely off, and, this, and he, they're letting, uh, and they're, after they're being watered, then you put them back on. Okay, next screen. Yes. I noticed in the prior slide that you didn't have the clear plastic on top of the bed. That, that was a fluke. I won't say on whose part, but it wasn't on mine. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on who gets to plant the beans and the squash. But if I'm planting them, it goes down. And then you also have the yeah, Oh, you betcha. <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah, you want it down on the soil and you want it over because you're trying to give, create heat. Okay, this is uh, our garden in Douglas with the fiber covers. And, uh, and this is May. And so I've got everything covered up and it's mainly defense against the birds because I've got very curious. Also have a chocolate Labrador and a Maine Coon wandering around who like to help me garden. It does, and they like to play hide and go seek, and this keeps the coon from hiding in the beds so the dog won't get him. So it's kind of an issue there. And it, it depends on who you're gardening with. I suppose maybe small children might be another issue, but I got dogs and cats. Okay, next one. Uh, these, once it warms up come June, you leave your hoops off uh, on most of your plants except for the cabbage family again and your squash. But this is horseradish and the hoops are just left in place and they're just working around them. Uh, depending on my plant, uh, the, the peas and so forth, I do take the hoops off once they're growing. I put them off to the side. And uh, if I don't have to, sometimes I weed around them, other times I take them off. But some people just leave them up. Okay, next one. Oh. Okay, that's it. Um, so, uh, hang on here. Uh, Sandy, maybe you can pass out. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'll have Sandy talk about the slugs and the copper. Here you go. To there is no one solution to uh, slugs. 
We have tried many. We have slowed them down. Uh, on our on our garden, it's in a flat area, and there's side hills on the side. I have taken and cleared the side hills and laid engineer's cloth down, took all the vegetation off the side hills, so they got that much more area to come across to get into the garden. Uh, they're, uh, I put crushed rock down on the paths because they don't, uh, they don't like to crawl over that. They get cut up or whatever. Uh, we put copper around all our beds, and the purpose of the copper is when the slug crawls, crawls up the bed and touches that copper with that slimy belly, he gets a little tinge, and that dissuades him. Not completely, but it will dissuade him. Uh, folks uh, use uh, uh, Sluggo or whatever other product that's out there, and you can buy fancy containers to put it in and put it and, and, and put it in your beds. What we have done is taken a uh, uh, plastic uh, pop bottle, cut the top off, inverted it, taped it, and then put the sluggo in there, and then bury this about halfway. It does a couple of things. It protects it from the rain, so the rain doesn't diminish the value of it, and it keeps it away from any animals that you might have around. And it works pretty good. Uh, Suzanne's got another method that she really gets unhappy with them, and she'll load up the uh, uh, bottle with, uh, uh, what do you use? Ammonia. Ammonia. And she'll go out there at night and she'll squirt them. And uh, it doesn't take very much ammonia to take care of a... a oh, you dilute it. You just dilute it. You put it in a spray bottle uh, like, like Windex comes in. And you can probably do half and half or la less. And I know we've got one uh, good friend up in West Juneau. She says it's even better if you put it in a squirt gun. <laughs> if you're feeling really mean and angry about things. OK. Um, some other things I was thinking of. Well, I think this is one we picked up in um, uh, Vancouver this past week. We went to Yard and Garden Land, a fabulous nursery. And this is uh, one would be great for a small flower bed or a, a small area. It already comes expandable, and they've got wires so you can stick it in the ground. So there are other things on the market. So you might think about that, too. But again, um, I take all those hoops off once the things grow, except trying to keep the maggots off my uh, broccoli, my cabbages. And it also helps on the onion and the garlic. There's another little fly that seems to bother the onions and the garlic. So I do try to keep my garlic uh, covered up, too, also. But that needs, sometimes I keep it loose because it grows tall. And so it's question time. Beer can work good. I have found some slugs, though, tend to come in and drink it and then crawl back out again. But, but beer in the bottle, you're right, it wouldn't, get, it wouldn't get out. It wouldn't get out. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, but it's a bad waste of beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing is, nothing's going to get rid of them. They're here with us, if, particularly if you have a lawn and they're going to find your garden. They love grass. That's where they really live. So it's an ongoing battle. OK, there's somebody in the back. When do you plant your beans in squash in the ground? Oh, let's see. Uh, May. May. Middle of May. Middle of May. Middle of May. Yep. Mm -hmm. When I plant. Beans, just for seeds? Yep. Yep. Uh, I would say growing beans, particularly, is sort of like going to Las Vegas. There's good years and there's bad years. Some years you win, some years you don't. And uh, I've had some years that I haven't gotten any beans at all. And bush beans, not pole beans. So uh, I, I guess so. But I have other master gardeners here. If you've got some other questions that they can answer too. Yes. Um, once you, if you're not covering, and thank you for the thing about covering the. Little mm -hmm. On the maggots? Yeah. Okay, we'll go to there. 
Number one, rotate, particularly growing vegetables. If you're growing flowers, you're stuck. If you're growing vegetables, you rotate your crops. You don't plant the same thing, and it goes root, fruit, uh, root, fruit, and let's see, legumes, and what's the last one? Here, it's off the top of my head. I'm going blank here in my old age. Oh, no, no, go, go, go. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Leaf, like lettuce, cabbage. Root, carrots, beets. Fruit, which would be your beans and your squash. And then legumes is your peas. So those four things. So no matter how small it is, even if you're growing a square foot garden of vegetables, move them over. And that's what I've, I'll move, I'll grow the peas in one bed, the next year I grow the, the lettuce, the following year I grow the squash, another year then I'll grow uh, my carrots or my beets or a potato, something like that. So rotate, don't plant year after year the same thing. And of course the big story everybody knows is the uh, Irish uh, potato famine. It's because they were growing those potatoes the same place year after year after year, and the blight came in, and once it's in the soil, you know, they starved, and people were dying. That's what caused the great migration to America. So again, rotate your, your vegetable crops. Flowers, they're gonna stay there. Okay, yes? What berries do you grow? Pardon? What berries? Oh, we grow, oh, I've given up on raspberries, and the reason I've given up on raspberries is because I have, uh, well, we, we have a neighborhood crawling with porcupines, and the porcupines just eat my raspberries year after year after year, so we have gone to currants. They don't seem to like the currants. I grow black currants, uh, white currants, and I've got champagne or pink currants growing. I also grew, grow uh, black and red gooseberries. They don't like the gooseberries. I have a big salmonberry patch, uh, which uh, I have had year after year. I don't know why. When there's other things around, porcupines will leave your salmonberries alone. It's very infuriating, isn't it? And then Sandy built me a big pergola a few years ago, and we have kiwi vines. And that is, uh, it's kind of good and it's bad at the same time. I grew them facing the taku winds and I wrapped the base of them for the first three years and then I took the burlap off after that. And I've, unfortunately I have only two boys and I've got three girls. And the girls, uh, if you grow one or the other, you're just fine, you won't get fruit. And, but you'll have wonderful flowers, they're slightly fragrant, they're very pretty, and you have pretty leaf color in the fall and in the spring. But it takes one boy to fertilize eight girls. And we get a five gallon pail of kiwi every fall in spite of my hacking that thing back as much as I can because it sends out whips everywhere, all, th all five of them. And we cut them back and we cut them back and now I make kiwi jam and I make kiwi ice cream and I, Ed Barsky talked me into making a kiwi pie but it, I waited till they were ripe and it was too sweet. I had too much sugar in it. So kiwis grow very well. So those are the fruits we grow plus rhubarb. I think every home in Juneau should have a big rhubarb plant stuck somewhere. If you don't fertilize it, it will still grow and put out big bushy leaves and it's very decorative. But if you add at least, I, I add about a bag, a 25 pound bag of manure to it every year because I like rhubarb and we have three rhubarb plants. So that's what we have for fruit. Anything else? Oh, I forgot, we do have crab apples. And those, we have, those of you who have crab apple trees, some years are good and some years are bad. And I have made uh, crab apple sauce, which I got from uh, Rain Tree Nursery. And they're long and oval and they're deep pink. And I think they're called docor. Do and they make wonderful applesauce and just fabulous. And Shirley Campbell has a fabulous crab apple tree out of her place at North Douglas, and it puts out a lot of fruit. So crab apples are wonderful here. I did have a cherry tree. I uh, gave Sandy a, a cherry tree, a pie cherry tree, uh, 20 years ago, 
porcupine hit it once and broke it in half and then it grew back and it finally blossomed and had we had uh, wonderful cherry pies but then the porcupine family found it and proceeded in the past three years to eat it down till it was a stick with a few branches down at the bottom like an upside down umbrella uh, with you know just the wire and uh, we finally had to take it down and now we're trying a plum and Sandy's got that encased in sheets of acrylic, an acrylic box. It looks very strange. I don't know. I hope the porcupines don't find it. Yes? Just clear plastic. Just clear plastic, sheet plastic. Yeah, clip it on. Uh, we roll those things up. They get a bit dirty, but we'll fold them up and we'll store them and then we'll put them back up the next year once we got it cut to the size of a bed. Okay, another question over here. Yeah, I'd be curious to know what some of the other gardeners do to keep out the porcupine. Oh, yes. Oh, Margo, Marion, do you have any thoughts? Um, dogs. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Floppy fence. Something that causes them to feel very insecure and about... Uh, Two-thirds of the way up, um, the chicken wire comes in a foot-wide kind of uh, roll. Mm -hmm. And you can tie wrap a layer of that chicken wire at about that length. And if they make it their way up the floppy fence, then they bump into the little edging of that chicken wire, and they won't go over the top of that. Mm, that's a good thought. The floppy fence and a little chicken wire rim. OK. Carol. Oh, hey, why don't I bring the mic down to her? Mm. Yeah. Just stand a face. A oh, fence that's not strong and sturdy, floppy. So put your posts upright and then some kind of very loose material. And then you can get rolls of chicken wire that are about a foot wide. And so uh, tie wrap that about two thirds of the way up on one edge so that it can flip over and be a barrier. If the porcupine does start up, it'll bump into that little edging and it won't get around it. Okay. And Margo said dogs. <laughs> Well, there's a real problem if you count on your dogs, <laughs> depending on <laughs> whether they decide that porcupine should be eaten or not. Um, we've really never found anything that works consistently against porcupines. Electricity. If you, have, if you don't have pets or small children, mm -hmm. that has been, that's been recommended to me. Mm -hmm. um, but we've always had animals or small children and have not tried it. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, Carol. Carol, the cord won't reach. You've got to come down here. She says gill net. I just, I just put the, the metal sticks in the ground and just stretch it along. Yeah. Okay, thanks.